Thanks for having me. All right. Let me figure out how to work this. Okay. So believe it or not, I do have a cheat sheet for this first slide because I have to tell you a lot about it. First of all, let me thank you, the organizers, uh, Daniel, Richard, and Johnny for having me here. This is the very first Python, uh, PyCon SK in Slovakia, which is my homeland, so it means a lot to me. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Second, he already introduced me. My name is Petra Kras. Uh, I'm a Slovak native. Ja hovorím úplne normálne plynulo po slovensky. Unfortunately, I'm required to speak English today, so uh, we can speak Slovak outside if you want to talk to me in Slovak. Uh, this is my email address here, um, Petka. Petka, Petka. Um, please email me your um, constructive feedback, any kind of suggestions on how to improve this talk. I'd like to do it better next time I do it. Uh, also, if you take any pictures of me, send them to me, okay? Um, yes, I'm a software engineer at Google. Um, I happen to be the first software engineer at Google from the former Czechoslovakia. So, yeah, for Slovakia. Yeah, for women. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, the thing I'm holding there is our 10-year uh, anniversary um, thank you plaque I received last year. Uh, it's going to be um, it's going to be 11 years this April. What else? Um, yes, I worked at three different teams. Actually, I worked at multiple. Actually, a few more, but I cannot talk about them because they were a uh, secret. <laughs> and um, lastly, um, in the spirit of Slovak hospitality, I brought gifts. All the Slovak people know that you never show up empty-handed, so I did bring uh, about six different products with Google Log on them, so obviously we don't have enough for everyone. I will make you work for it. Six of you will receive something, and maybe someone also gets the bag that it came in. <laughs> All right, and before I go to the next slide, if you hear a child crying, it's because my 10-year-old my nugget is outside, so please forgive her. The 10-month-old, okay. <laughs> month old. All right, what is this? Who knows what this is? You're going to get a prize if you know what this is. Yell. Not the picture. What's, what is the text? No, mission statement. That's the word I was looking for. Come here. Why am I showing you Google's mission statement? Well, Everything we do is we do for a reason, right? We're trying to achieve something. So it's, it's kind of nice to remind yourself what is it that Google wants to achieve. We are trying to organize all your information and make it accessible and useful. So pick what you like. There's t-shirts, there's a bag, there is a, three types of uh, vessels for liquids. T-shirt? Yeah. What size? There's a large and there's a... Okay, I don't know what this is. Maybe an L. Okay, you're welcome. Yes, it's our mission statement, and everyone at Google actually knows this. And this picture I took from my office, believe it or not, that's my view. I live in a postcard. I work in a postcard. So what am I uh, here to talk about? I'm going to tell you about three different things. I'm going to spend uh, the first part of my talk giving you, because you're all geeks and engineers, this is going to be a little more technical. I'm going to give you the overview of our developer environment. I'm going to tell you what tools we use, um, what languages we use. Uh, how we compile our code. I'm going to show you some pictures of the work environment, the actual offices that we work at. And then I'm going to move, move to uh, briefly describing the different development workflows used in the industry, not only in software, but also in hardware. And so that I can actually, so that you will see how we arrived at the last one, which we hope is the most advanced one. And it's the one that we use at Google. I wish I had this clicker thing. I don't have a clicker thing. I have to do it manually here. Okay, so the first thing is the Google development environment. And this is another opportunity to receive a, another Google piece of swag. What kind of swag would you like? Um, who knows how big is Google? Who knows how, how big Google is? How many engineers? Okay, not how many employees, how many engineers we have as of last year? Sixty? We're talking about software engineers, not all employees. More than 15,000? More than 20? I heard some female voice over there, 25,000. Yes, come get something. We don't have female shirt, I'm, I'm, I apologize. We usually do, but didn't get any today, so we probably can pick some of the other things. 
We do have 25,000 engineers. When I joined in 2005, there were 2,500 total employees, so maybe 1,000 engineers. Now, what, 10 years later, we have 25,000 engineers plus at least as much, at least as many um, people that work in non-engineering departments as, uh, and then tons of contractors. Yeah, I'll just put it here for everyone to admire. In the shopping bag. Oh, it's this is a farmer's market. <laughs> Enjoy. All right, another opportunity to get uh, another present. How many change lists or submits, how many chunks of codes do we check in into our code repository in a single day? Not on a weekend, but on a weekday. Fifty less than uh, twenty? More than ten thousand? Fifteen, someone said fifteen over there. Come down, get something. Okay, we still have a few more left. Okay, so fifteen thousand of them are human and 30,000 are uh, robotic. So yeah, uh, 35 million per year, and it's going up. And lastly, how big is our code base? How many lines of code do you think Google has, both human and uh, robotic generated lines of code? Two billion. Two billion. Who said two billion? Come down. Yes, two billion lines of code, and in a in any given workday, 800,000 compilations, and these compilations generate two petabytes worth of data in a single day. All right, enough of statistics. You're welcome. Enjoy. Uh, now I'm going to tell you more. This is more for the geeks here. Uh, what is the developer environment like? Uh, we have our own um, Linux distribution. It's called Gubuntu. It's, it's a version of Ubuntu with extra security features and whatnot. Uh, you can Google it. There's a Wikipedia article about it, apparently. Uh, but before I go into that, all change lists or <coughs> submits or commits are uh, peer reviewed. So two people see or read, we do have some uh, blind coworkers, um, all code that goes into code repository. And, uh, Almost all projects are stored in a single ginormous uh, shared repository that we all have access to. So for example, I have access to any non-secret project within Google. And I'm, I mean, I'm, when I mean non-secret, I mean within Google, non-secret. Um, uh, we develop at head and we have uh, continuous integration. So that basically ensures that anything that gets checked in passes tests before it, it gets submitted. Uh, so we don't break uh, our coworkers. And there are a few buzzwords here. Uh, server side, we mainly develop in C++, Java, uh, Python, and Go. Uh, there are teams that use other languages, but these are the main ones. Obviously, the client side, it depends on what kind of client it is. The iOS would be Objective-C, and then Android would be Java, and uh, the web would, would be JavaScript, uh, um, um, HTML, CSS. Uh, anyone's? I mean, people are allowed to use any editor, editor they like. Um, the most popular one is Eclipse. I use Eclipse. There are teams that use IntelliJ. Um, we usually use uh, Emacs or VI for uh, small you know, text file edits. Anything that's not Java, we, we usually edit in, in Emacs. And this is the most interesting part of this uh, slide. Most of the infrastructure that we use to develop and build our code is developed internally. We have our own build system called Blaze, which was partially uh, open sourced as Bazel. You can also Google that. Uh, we use our own build language, which is uh, following Python syntax. Blaze, by the way, is fully implemented in Python. Um, we use our own bug tracking system called Bugonizer. We uh, have used Perforce for code repository. We switched to Piper which uses Sitsi as the kind of like a backend server that allows us. Sitsi means uh, clients in the cloud or changes in the cloud. I think clients in the cloud. And it allows us to view our pending or old existing submitted changes either in the browser or in, uh, in our client uh, 
on the workstation. Uh, and it makes it appear on the client as if it was a local file system. It's like a virtual local file system. So I have access to all of the Google code base from my file system as if it was locally stored on my computer. Uh, the last few things I wanted to mention is code search is a super, super useful tool. That's the tool that I use to search for example of other examples of the code. Anytime I try to figure out how certain things are done or I want to see if someone else has done it and I can reuse it, I go into code search and I'm searching for buzzwords and keywords to see if there's other code that does similar things to my code so I can inspire myself, copy and paste or borrow or you know, see how, how other people implemented uh, the same problem that I'm working on. Um, Mondrian and Critique are uh, two code reviewing tools, like I mentioned at the top of the list. All changes are peer reviewed, so whenever I create a change list, I create a list of files that I'm removing, editing, branching, or adding, um, I send it to someone else. And that person uses, now Critique, previously Mondrian, to view them in like a diff environment. It's a web app, it has like left and right side. You can see the code before the change, code after the change. You can start typing inside of the lines to suggest to the other person, the author of the CL, the change list, what to change. It's a really nice tool to communicate uh, the, the process of a code review. Mondrian was, by the way, the, the first large project developed uh, by, uh, by Guido van Rossum, who is, as all you know, hopefully uh, the Python creator. Mondrian was fully implemented in, in, uh, in Python. I'm not sure if Critique is. So you can probably search for any of these. They were publicly, at some point, announced. And now I'm gonna talk about how we organize within uh, our floor on, um, at Google how our team structured, who reports to whom, and uh, why it's, it's good and why it works for us. So here's a typical structure. You obviously have a VP of engineering there, VP of engineering. She, she might report to SVP, senior VP of engineering, and that person might report to CEO, for example. But the, a typical VP of engineering would be uh, managing uh, multiple engineering directors. An engineering director would then be managing multiple engineering managers, and each manager manages anywhere between four to 30 people. And what's the point of this slide is, notice how flat this last level is. It's, it's clear that we're trying to keep the engineering structure quite flat. We are not trying to put too many levels of managers. Uh, at some point, I was like four levels away from Larry Page um, in terms of reporting structure. So you can imagine how big the company is and how, how flat it is at the very bottom. Um, so this does look like it's a really big team. How can they all work together? Well, you can think of this like this can be, let's say, Gmail team. It'll be way more people than that, right? But each of these groups of people belong into a different sub-team, depending on what project needs to be done right now. So it does look like this is a single team, and we are a single team. We would go to the same offsite together. But uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, we work in groups. So this is like a typical division you would have anywhere between four to seven people in a team, in a sub-team. Those are the people that you work with every single day. Every team has to have one tech lead, TL. Um, tech lead is um, one of the software engineers that is demonstrating uh, leadership skills and is good at organizing the work for the team and can, can represent the team in, in meetings and so forth. Uh, and works with the manager with, uh, and the VP on the planning and launches and things like that. Um, some software engineers might be managing an intern for the summer. Um, some software engineers that are tech leads might be promoted to managers. TLM means tech lead manager. A tech lead manager is just like any other tech lead, but they also have to have additional manager duties. I don't think I'm going to go into this slide. This is basically a description of all those uh, three-letter acronyms um, from the previous slide, but I think it was clear from that. And uh, I'm going to end with some pictures here. This section uh, of my talk was about showing you the work environment and the software environment that we work in. This is a picture of circa 2008, Gmail. Um, around the time when Gmail just went out of beta, uh, Gmail was five years old. We, as you can see, worked in a really dark, small room. Um, but the point here is to show you that people sit next to each other, they hear each other, 
it, it works. You don't need to have your own office. I'm sure many of you work in similar situations where you have people near you. It uh, for, um, enhances collaboration between people. This is my dog. She's not here anymore. But she used to go to work. And uh, this is the little larger room that we moved to uh, circa 2011, 2012. Again, clusters of desks. And let's say this floor that you can see here, it maybe contains people from two teams, two sub-teams. And there's offices. Some offices might have four or five people in them. That's another team in the office. And on the other side of the wall, there might be another team with like four to six people. Uh, what's worth pointing out in this picture here, on the right side, do you see this green thing, the monitor with green thing on it? Upper right? Do you see it? Yes, no? Yes. Um, you can see lines of color. Most of them are green, but two of them are red. Those are continuous builds that I was telling you about. Uh, we define which part of code base gets continuously built and tested from a small section, the uh, smoke test. We can have a build called smoke test. We can have build that builds completely everything, the world. <laughs> we call it the world. Uh, or it can be a build that only runs integration tests, which are flaky and they run every 30 minutes or something. And you want to separate them into separate builds so it doesn't slow down the other builds. So depending on the team's needs, they might create one or more continuous builds. They configure them. And we can see their status right there on the screen. So anytime I want to sync to head, if everything's green, I know I'm good. I can sync. Nothing's broken. All right, last few pictures. This is, again, the view from my desk. Um, I love taking pictures because it changes every single day. It's pretty amazing. Some of them are taken in a, in a single day. All right. Huh? Oh, there's, here's a fog uh, clouds. Well, when there is fog, you cannot see the bridge, so I wouldn't be able to show you the picture. <laughs> um, so these offices are nice, but what is it that we're trying to do inside? No? No one was paying attention earlier in the talk? Who said organizing? Come down, get, get to one of these things. We have, I think, two things left here. Yes, we're trying to organize world information, make it universally accessible and useful. OK, let's move into the second section of my talk. I'm going to talk about, enjoy. I'm going to talk about uh, the different ways companies develop products or software. This is just really a high level. It's more like a walk down the history lane. It's more like a, a background on how things used to be done. And then I'm going to talk about what we do at Google. So anytime you need to create anything, um, you start with an idea, right? Um, a given feature starts with an idea. Then you tell someone about your idea, right? Your PM or your manager or someone. And a group of people decides that it's, that it's time to do it. So it's being planned. It's in some list waiting for the time when it's a good time to start implementing it. So it, take, it spends a few days or weeks uh, in some kind of queue. It's being planned. And then it spends another chunk of time, anywhere between days and months, maybe even years, uh, being worked on. People are working on this. Uh, when it's done, it goes into the co code review. When it's code reviewed, checked in, then maybe QA team is testing it in case of a mobile application. Maybe the QA team needs to get that Android build that contains your change and uh, test all the functionality, make sure it works. And then it goes into canary. Uh, by the way, the word canary, I, I spent 10 years saying it wrong. I used to say canary. And you know the, what canary and canary, what the difference is? Canary is uh, conservare. That's where you make uh, cans. And canary is, is the staging environment uh, which you use to uh, release code to production. So now I know how to say it. Uh, once it's in canary for some time, no, canary for some time. <laughs> like I said, I always do wrong. Um, then it goes live. Um, you start with 5%, 1%, and, and then grow, slowly ramp it up to 100% of users. So all of this takes a lot of time, from the moment someone thinks of the idea to the moment when it's live and public. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to shrink this total length. It takes total time it takes to make all of this, right? 
we don't want to spend years to develop a single feature. So we want to do this fast, and therefore we need to only do what needs to be done so we don't spend our spare cycles on things that are unnecessary. And as far as the company cares, we, they want to maximize return on investment on developer time. So how do you speed up your development? You can either add resources, or as we call it, throw money at it, or throw people at it, or you can reduce waste. So what do you think we should be doing? You got the last prize. <laughs> yes, reduce waste. And I'm going to tell you basically how we do that. Uh, I'm going to just fly through this one. We are not trying to waste money. There are some examples, or some people believe, here's the source, that between 60 billion and 70 billion, that's uh, billion is milliarda in Slovak, right? Uh, of uh, US dollars that are wasted every single year. And there is a list of some failed products you can look at. Uh, my homeland now, state of California, wasted how much? $44 million on uh, a DMV system, Department of Motor Vehicles, um, implemented something which they never used and wasted $44 million. So we're trying to avoid this. Okay, so how do companies develop software? They are really most common, three of them are most common um, methodologies. The old school waterfall, the spiral, and the agile. Have you heard of waterfall? Some of you, who heard of Spiral? And who heard of Agile? Okay, good. So um, apparently, Waterfall is the predecessor of a Spiral, and Spiral is the predecessor of Agile. So this is the grandma, mommy, and that's the child. Um, let me tell you about Waterfall. What's a Waterfall? It comes from manufacturing and construction industries. So imagine you're building you're trying to construct a building. Uh, before you start building it, you need to have, you need to know the requirements. The design needs to be done. And then you can build it. And then someone comes in and does, you know, fire department check and whatnot, verifies that the building's functional. And then it can be used and maintained. This entire thing might take years. It wouldn't take months, it would take years. We obviously cannot use this methodology in software because you don't know what users want. You cannot predict how, what requirements you will have a month from now, two months from now, a year from now. But it's, it's good to know what the waterfall is or what it was. Um, so the first software companies tried to adapt waterfall to their needs. And what they did, they invented this thing called a spiral methodology which basically is a waterfall, but many times in a row. Like small waterfalls, one after another. At the end of each waterfall, you don't end up with an, a finished product, but you end up with a prototype. So each spiral goes through the same stages that the waterfall would go through, but ends in a prototype. So it's zero base, so you start prototype zero, prototype one, prototype two, and, and the entire cycle takes about six months in average. Well, that's much better than doing it all at once and five years down the road coming up with a product no one wants, but it's still pretty slow that you have a prototype in six months. So um, imagine it's like if you were driving a boat. Imagine you're driving a boat and you're not allowed to steer the wheel like this, but you're only allowed to steer the wheel once an hour. Right? You will go like zigzag. You're not going to go straight. You're wasting a lot of energy if you're not focused. So this doesn't really work well, at least for us. And here comes Agile. So Agile is an, basically a modified uh, spiral, which is a constantly spinning in a very short cycles that are not six months long, but more like a week or week and a half or two weeks long. Um, I'm sure all of you have, you have your own definition of what Agile is. I'm not going to argue with anyone because we can get into heated discussions here. Um, this is how I define it. Customer collaboration is uh, number one. You need to know your customers. In our case, in my current team, our product manager knows our customers. So product manager is really my customer. 
and I get constant feedback from product manager. I talk to them every single day. I don't get requirements up front and then work for six months. I keep coming to product manager every day or every other day and, and clarifying things or suggesting, suggesting slight modifications to the original requirements based on uh, engineering constraints. Um, so this allows us to respond to change really quickly and uh, not spend weeks or months doing something that at the end no one's gonna want or use. Uh, we iterate based on features, not, we are not creating prototypes, we are creating features. So each feature has a set of tasks and we are working on them in a given iteration. We release early and often and we get feedback from customers. Uh, when I say early and, uh, and often, I check in my code and the next continuous build might pick it up in 40 minutes. Two hours later, my code is released in some staging in sandbox environment. So for example, I can use it on my phone. Obviously it's not going to production, no one's gonna use it outside of Google, but I get to use this. We used to do this with Gmail and it was driving me crazy. When I was on Gmail team, if someone broke the build or checked in a bad feature, no one could use their email. Because we were, we call it dog fooding, we were, that's called actually fish fooding. We were fish fooding our own code. And when we broke something, everyone on our team was pissed at us. So. That's a really good motivator to not break things. Uh, where am I? Self-organization. Uh, teams form based on the current project needs. The team that I'm on, it's never set in stone. Two months later, I might be in a different team. The manager will be just like moving the people from one team to another depending on where we need more help. Open office to speed collaboration. I already have shown you some pictures of our offices and uh, frequent introspection. Um, I will talk about retrospectives uh, almost at the end of the talk. There are a few more words that you must have heard in relation to, in conjunction to uh, the word agile. And again, everyone defines them differently. This is how I define them. Extreme programming, Scrum and Kanban. Extreme programming is known for uh, so-called promiscuous pairing. You are promiscuous in terms of who you are coding with, and every day you might code with someone else. That's why, that's why there's a double chair. One day you might be coding with a coworker, another day you're going to, talk, to code with someone over the Google Hangout, or you basically never know who you're gonna work next day. It all depends who is free and who needs help. Um, Scrum is a project management methodology, so I don't know anything about it. Don't ask me about Scrum, but I know that it's not something we use. Project managers use it. And Kanban is an idea that came from uh, just-in-time manufacturing from Japan. Uh, I was told that Kanban means uh, whiteboard or card or something like that. Do we have a Japanese person here? No? So it's supposed to be some kind of card or tablet or something. And here's a picture of a Kanban card from what is this? Is this like a Toyota or something? Toyota Altona car. Um, a Kanban card contains the information that's attached to a physical object, in this case, in the car manufacturing, and it tells you what this thing is, where it was just, where it has been just now, and where it's going next. All you need to know is what is this thing, and where, what am I supposed to do with it now? And that's what Kanban car contain, card contains. It doesn't talk about anything that's like five steps down the line. It only talks about the previous and the very next step, or only the next step. And we're gonna, uh, impl uh, we're gonna borrow the idea of Kanban in the next slides. That's why I'm showing it to you. So we're going to the last and actually the, the largest part of my talk. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how we at Google do Agile. So what does Google will do? A little bit of everything, we call it Agile, we don't have special words for it. And you know how I was showing you the Google mission statement? There's another thing that we keep reminding ourselves of, it's called 10 things we find to be true. You can just Google it, it's just search for 10 things, it should be like first or second result. Um, it's a list of things that, that are the, the, the truths that we believe in. The first one is focus on the users and everything else will follow. Uh, and in that spirit, we do focus on users. We start with user stories. And uh, these come from the PM or from the users themselves. 
Uh, and as engineers, I never think of user stories. I only think of t engineering tasks. There is a big difference between user stories and engineering tasks. This is one of the biggest problems that I see when I, um, when I see how other companies often do agile. They don't differentiate between user story and engineering task. Uh, a user story example would be um, you want to build ATM. Um, that's in Slovak, that's bankomat. You want to build an ATM. Um, it needs to have some features, so two features might be ATM needs to allow users to see their balance. Another feature might be a district bank manager might want to view all the ATM usage in their town. Um, these are user stories. If someone gives that to me, I don't know what to do with it. I'm an engineer. Like, I, don't, I don't know, right? So product manager and uh, UX team work on these ideas of the user stories. And they come up with specific requirements. They give us mocks, for example, of what the screen should look like and what it should say and how the user types in their credentials and whatnot, right? We receive that as engineers, and we then translate that, this user story, into engineering tasks. Um, here is an example. Actually, next slide will have an example. But to give you an idea, a task is a single Kanban card. <coughs> from the previous slide, which describes what needs to be done. That thing that needs to be done shouldn't take more than two to 12 hours of work. It should never be a task that takes a week. If it takes a week, break it down into smaller tasks. It should be very digestible, very nice, small task that you won't, you're not going to be afraid to pick up from a whiteboard or from a spreadsheet. Something you want to work on, because you know it's not too small and it's not too big. Actually, there's no such thing as too small. You can have a one-line change, and it might take you three hours. Amen. <laughs> um, a typical task will have a description. It has to have a size, which I'm going to talk about later. And it needs to have an owner once someone starts working on it. And a state, which is the most important thing. We need to know what's going on with this thing. Is anyone working on it? Is it done? Is it blocked? Is it being tested? Or is it already out in production? So uh, the way we break down the tasks would be for, for a, a user story that says uh, a bankomat ATM user needs to view their balance, we might break it down into a task that first needs to define the API between the bank and the client, which is on the bankomat, right, the ATM, whatever software that thing runs. So someone needs to define the API. So that's the first task then someone needs to implement this API on the back end, right? In whatever language of choice they have, hopefully Python. Um, and that will obviously break down into many other more tasks, because you need to authenticate the users, you need to deal with load balancing, you have a million other things you need to worry about as a back end engineer. But PM doesn't care. They only care that you're going to allow users to view their balance, right? This is engineering problem to figure out what needs to be done and to break this down into tasks. PM never gives me tasks, never. They only tell me what they want the user to have, view, or use, right? I'm the one who decides how it gets done, and I dis define these tasks. So this will be a typical second task, and third task might be a, a client development, some kind of user interface some screen that's going to display the balance in the actual ATM. I don't know what that thing runs. Some HTTP, some, some PHP, HTML, CSS. So I don't know. Whatever they use, right? Some client developer will take that and break that into multiple tasks for themselves. So again, PM doesn't know anything about engineering tasks. That's our internal problem, how we divide them up. PM only cares about user stories. And that's why it's important to never give user stories to engineers and tell them, work on this, because they don't know how. They only know how to work on tasks. They can break them up down into smaller tasks, but it's not OK to just give someone a story and be like, go implement this, because you don't implement a story. You implement a task. So where do we put these tasks? You can put them, oh, we don't have a gift anyways, OK, into list buckets and or swim lanes. So depending on the state, if it's, is it being worked on, or 
is it down or is it blocked or is it being tested or depending on the state, you put it in some, in, in some kind of a, a bucket. And what do these buckets look like? So it depends. If all of you and your coworkers are in the same room and you don't work uh, in a distributed work environment, you can just have a simple whiteboard where you're going to put this thing called swim lanes. You know how at the bottom of a swimming pool you have these lines, swim lanes? So each of these is a swim lane. And each swim lane is, uh, contains tasks that have the same state. On the left, for example, you have scheduled, which I believe is backlog. This big swim lane right here is working on, which means pending, working on, being developed. This thing means checked in. I don't know why they have that swim lane. You figure out which swim lanes you need. It's not something that you know before you start working as a team. Sometimes you need to add more swim lanes, and that's fine. And then here they have in QA, and there's one more on the right, which I don't know what that is. Maybe maybe done or verified or tested or something. Um, or you can use, instead of a whiteboard, if you, if you want to keep everything in a spreadsheet and, for example, if you want to be able to work from home and have access to this, instead of pointing a camera at the whiteboard and doing a live stream, you can just put everything in a spreadsheet. So this is another example of how you can put the same information in a spreadsheet. So it's up to you how you visualize it. Um, you can use any tool available out there. There are a uh, few that I recommend. Whiteboard is the easiest one. There's something, something special about being able to hold that card in your hand, something tangible about it that, you, that makes you feel like, OK, this is a thing I need to do. I'm holding it in my hands. I'm not going to throw it away. It's a task. I have to do it. You don't have that feeling when you're looking at a spreadsheet. But spreadsheet works just fine. Uh, you can use your favorite tracking software, Pivotal Tracker, or the ever-popular Asana uh, for your uh, task tracking. So now that I told you where we put these things, I'm going to talk about these logical buckets uh, based on the state. And I'll have to drink. All right. So before you start working on something, it's just an idea, right? It might not even be a task. It might just be a user story. You didn't bother breaking it down into a task. It's still just a user story. It's something that your PM told you. And you're like, yeah, 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 sure, sure. I'll, one day we'll do it. Yeah, right. And you know you'll never do it, OK? Or you might do it one day. So what do you do with this stuff that people ask you to do, right? You put it on ice so it doesn't get spoiled. That's why it's called icebox. It's a box full of ice where you can put meat and it stays fresh. <laughs> you put tasks in it that might get done one day or never. There's no commitment. You don't feel bad about having a million things in icebox. It's just an icebox. It's fine. It's frozen. Nothing's going to happen to it. The next bucket that you have is the one that you use most often. Uh, it's called backlog or scheduled, or to be worked on next. Backlog, I will have a separate slide about it. Uh, I think we all know what backlog is. It just means something that you need to do in the next week or two. Then you have the, the one that shows you what is being worked on, current, or working on, or in progress. You can call it whatever you want. And when it's, once it's done, it goes into the done bucket. Now. Like you saw in those swim lines in the picture, some people add more buckets. If you have a big QA team and you need to QA everything, then you might have a bucket called in QA or something like that. So it's up to you what, you, what your company needs. So let's talk about Icebox. Uh, in my specific implementation, this is how I would implement an Icebox in a spreadsheet. You can put it on the back of the whiteboard. When I, did, when I used whiteboards, I used to put every single request that came my way when I was a tech lead, every request that other teams gave me or my manager gave me or the PMs gave me, I would write down on a card as a user story, and I would just slap it on the back of a whiteboard so no one can see it. It's not like I'm going to look at it every day and feel bad that I haven't done it, right? Um, so when our team became more distributed and some people were working from home and we started using uh, a spreadsheet, this is actually a Google spreadsheet, works really well for sharing. Uh, 
I just created a separate tab for it. It's a, it's a, it's a tab at the bottom of a spreadsheet. So we have two tabs. This is the, the second tab. And here's an example. You can put both uh, user stories, features, or tasks into it. It doesn't matter. You don't need to break it down into tasks, but you can. It's up to you. <coughs> someone asked me for some, to, to do something, and I just put it right here. Or someone reports a bug, I just put it right there. I can put a link to the bugonizer so I can see the details or some stack trace or something that's related to the bug. But as a task or as, as a user story, it lives here until we decide that it's time to start working on it. All right, so that's Icebox. That's pretty straightforward. Here I'm saying um, that I'm showing you that a single feature might be breaking, broken down into tasks, but doesn't need to be. Like these guys aren't broken down into tasks. They probably never get done anyways. So every request starts in Icebox, unless you have like a production emergency and, and, and you need to fix something right away. You're not gonna put it in Icebox, but everything else goes into Icebox first. It's a dumping ground for all the requests and bugs. And you may never get done, and probably will never get done. Maybe 90% of it, maybe 80. So that's Icebox. Backlog. So what I've done, uh, I created a spreadsheet, a sheet within a spreadsheet, a tab, that contains multiple states. So this is both backlog, in progress, and done. You don't need to have separate spreadsheet for every single state. Sometimes it makes sense to have it all in one place. What this spreadsheet contains is um, everything that is being done this iteration. And this is what every team member looks at every single day. This is the most import important sheet. You don't, you, you don't even need to keep the icebox fancy. That can be like a pile of papers on someone's desk. But this needs to be organized. This is the thing you need to put most effort into because this is what runs your team. As you can see, it's split into two sections here. <coughs> You don't put more than one or one and a half iterations worth of tasks here. So in our case, the iteration was one week long. Uh, it was from October 7th to October 14th. So that's our current iter iteration, or it was our current iteration. And I put a few more here for the next iteration, just in case someone gets really fast and like we finish it before the end of the week and we have nothing else to work on. We can start working on this. But the thing about this blue line is what we really care about. That's what we are planning to accomplish in the week. As you can see, every single feature is broken down into tasks. Like, like notice feature A is there twice. And it's because we think that it's important to finish the task one and task two from, from uh, user story B before we continue working on user story A. So you can actually break up user stories uh, and prioritize with them, uh, the task within them. Uh, you don't need to finish the entire user story all at once. Um, and uh, let me show you what the, is the backlog. In this case, oh yeah, it must be ordered by priority. That's very important. The thing on top has to be done first, no matter how fun or boring the task is. You never pre-assign pre owners. Even if there is someone who has done it a million times, you never ask anyone to do it because everyone on the team needs to learn how to do it. And if I have never done it, and I happen to be free now, I'm gonna take that task. And if I don't know how, I will talk to the person who has done it last time. It will, it will take me a little longer first time I do it, but if I do it two or three times, a similar kind of thing, I'll know how to do it. And now we have two experts on the team. You don't want to create these silos where someone gets hit by a bus and no one knows how to do this thing. This is very important. People are nodding here, okay. Someone agrees. Okay. So do not pre-assign owners. And don't put more than one or one and a half amount of worth of uh, uh, iterations. Don't put too, ma too many tasks there. Because you don't know what's gonna happen next week. Maybe by the, end of, by the end of this week, you don't even want to work on this. So why did you waste your time planning this five weeks ahead, when this can change any time. We want to be agile, remember. We don't plan for many, many weeks. We only plan for one iteration. Am I speaking too fast? I usually do. <laughs> huh? Am I what? I'm agile. <laughs> okay. 
So yeah, this is very important. You always pick the highest priority task that is not already taken. Uh, current. This is just how you mark what is being worked on. And when you work on something, you put your name there so people can tell what you're doing. In this case, Maria and Alex are both working on tasks. I am idle, obviously, because I just finished the first task. So that means I need to pick the next task. Which task should I pick now? Task three, uh, it says blocked. I need to wait until Maria is done with task two. Which task should I pick? Yeah, feature B task two. That's the one I put my name next to and I mark it as in progress. All right. So this is our backlog. It's really within the same iteration. We call it iteration spreadsheet because it contains everything we need for a single iteration. It contains backlog, it contains uh, current working on and it contains done for this iteration. So working on and done. And this is our bucket for things that were done. At the end of the week, what does this look like? Hopefully, it's all green. So by the end of the iteration, you, you expect it to be green and you can actually track it. At the end of the week, you can add up all these points, get a total here and graph it over time just to see how, they call it velocity, to see how fast your team can move in terms of points. Those are not days, those are points, and I'll talk about them later. So again, engineers don't care about this tracking because they're just working on tasks, right? But um, PMs and managers, they always ask you, when are you gonna be done? How long is this gonna take? So what I tell them, well, give me the user stories. I'm gonna break them down into tasks and I'm gonna add up, then we need to estimate all the tasks, and then I can add up all the points, and if it says, if it says 100 points, right? If my team does 10 points per week, I'll tell them it's gonna take 10 weeks. And it turns out it's a much better way of predicting how long things take than asking someone how long it's gonna take them. Because when, when you ask anyone how long it's gonna take them, they will, they think they can do it in two weeks, it's gonna take them four or six. Everything takes longer than people think and engineers or anyone cannot predict how long things are gonna take. True that. So that's why we think in terms of points, not time. And these points mean how complicated things are, how difficult this task is, not how long it's gonna take me. Okay. Pop quiz, which buckets do we have? The most important four. And I will give you pens, I only have three pens left. Not Icebox. Icebox. Backlog, current or working on. Done, okay. There you go. Um, yes. These are the four that you absolutely should have. You call them whatever you want, in whatever language you speak, but it just makes sense. You need to have these four. And you can add more if you need to. There is some special step or state that your tasks go into. You can add more, but it all depends on the type of the project you work on. So now I'm gonna tell you about how do these tasks end up on the whiteboard or in the backlog? How do we put them in the backlog? Who puts them in the backlog? Because I said, PM does not think in terms of tasks. PM thinks in terms of user stories. Engineers think in terms of tasks. So who does the translation between the user story and the tasks? Am I speaking too slow now? <laughs> I don't know, I never know if I'm going too fast or too slow. I try to slow down. So obviously it happens at a meeting. It doesn't need to be in the, in the meeting room. It can be at someone's desk. It doesn't need to involve every team member, you really need only three people, three or four people. The rest of the team doesn't need to be there. Let them have their hours of their life, like let them work on something else. You don't need to put the whole team in the same room. But in order to break tasks down into, uh, into users, you know, break down user stories into tasks, you need at least three people because one person can never think of all the things that need to be done. You need to define what needs to be done. That's, that, that's what it is. By breaking tasks, uh, by breaking user stories into tasks, 
you're really just like going through an exercise in your head of how am I going to implement this? Oh, I need this, I need that. Oh, we need to do this first, and we need to do that first, and oh, it's blocked because that team needs to finish that first. Like, you go through the exercise in your head to realize what needs to be done, and then you realize how much work it is and how long, how long it might take because you're blocked on that person, blocked on that team, and you have to come up with that workaround. And you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So it happens during a meeting called planning meeting. So pre-planning meeting is when a PM and tech lead meets. So I basically come to the PM and be like, hey, so you want me to, make, to, to do this feature? Okay, how do, you, how do you like envision that to look like? So I get a product requirements document or some mocks or something. I, I might have clarifying questions. I'm trying to understand as a tech lead, what is it that we need to implement, that my team needs to implement? Uh, once I understand it, then I am gonna break this down into multiple tasks. And then I'm gonna share it with one or two members of my team to quickly read through it to see if it makes sense if I miss anything, because they'll be like, oh, you forgot this. You cannot use this form of authentication because that's deprecated. We need to implement this new authenticator, blah, 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 right? There's always something that prevents you from easily finishing your tasks. So you try to identify these blockers at this stage. And this is before I meet with the rest of my team. And now that I'm done with it, a Wednesday comes by, we, we have, uh, where is it? One hour, which really, it should be 30 minutes. It shouldn't be one hour. You can do it in 30 minutes. We have a 30-minute meeting, and that's when the magic happens. This is, this is the part that I hope I will be able to convey to you. It has a specific way of conducting this meeting. It's not just like, oh, let's read through these stories and let's see how hard they are. Let's put some points next to them. Let's estimate it. It's not like that. There is, you're not always allowed to talk. You're, you have to follow a certain structure. Um, there is a person that's uh, facilitating the meeting, the meeting facilitator. It can be the TL or it can be someone else. If you want to empower or grow leaders from within your team, you just ask a different person every week to run this meeting. And this person comes to the meeting, let's say my coworker, Alex. And I'll be like, okay, Alex is running this uh, estimation meeting today. So Alex goes into the spreadsheet. And... Uh, let me go back to the spreadsheet, actually. Alex opens the spreadsheet. This entire row is clear. There's no numbers here. And he just reads out task one, feature eight. He reads it out, out loud. And we hold these cards, or you can use your fingers. It's much easier with fingers. And he goes, OK, one, two, three. And we vote. So I gave it two points. We look around at the table. And we see how many other points, how many points other people gave. So for example, here, this is what happens. So let's say we have three people in the team and two of them say two and one of them has five. We're like, okay, so the person who said five, they either don't realize how easy this task is or they, they know something we don't know, right? Because maybe it is a lot more work and we just didn't know. And this is the most important part. We learn from one another what really needs to be done. And we, it's like part of the understanding of how things get, get done allow us to work only, only on the things that need to get done. Do you know what I mean? If, if this person picked up the task, the person who said it's two points, actually no. Imagine this is a super easy task. It only takes really two points. If we didn't estimate this and the third person picked it up who thinks it's too much work, they might do it in like a really bad brute force way or use the wrong API to do it or implement an API that already exists or do something that's unnecessary to do. And because we talk about this at the meeting, we are like, wait a second, this isn't five points. Why do you think it's five points? And we clarify this. We save this guy or girl a few days worth of work because they don't have to reinvent the wheel, so to say, but they will do it the easy way that these two people know, know how to do, right? So um, this is what the meeting looks like. So I read the task. Define an API for 
uh, ATM uh, for fetching balances from the, from the ATMs. That's the task. I read it out, or the person reads it out. And I say, one, two, three. People lift their hands, or the cards with the numbers. This is what the cards look like. It's a, it's a modified Fibonacci scale. Um, and I look around the table. If there, is, if there are no obviously big outliers or small outliers, we don't even discuss this. I'm just going to write down like an average. I just calculate the mean and write it down. I'll just say two. And we go to the next task. No discussion needed because obviously everyone knows how to do it and they think it's an easy task. If there is an outlier, then we go by pointing at the person with the lowest score, one of the people that said two, and I say, to do this task, and they say, to do this task, you always have to say, to do this task, one has to do A, B, and C. Okay, and then I say, okay, you, the person with five, and they say, to do this task, one has to do A, B, and C, plus I have to do this, this, and that. We're like, oh, okay, let's revote. One, two, three. I mean, everyone now says five, because everyone understood this is actually more work. And in our head, we know what it takes to do, and that's part of the, the magic of estimating. So the estimating for, for a product manager, for them, it's useful because they, that allows the tech lead to kind of give them the timeline, like how long it's gonna take, right? But really, we are not estimating it for product manager. We're estimating it so that we know how to do these tasks. And then we don't have to have daily stand-ups and ask people for help all the time or see someone waste two weeks doing something that's completely unnecessary. So the planning poker is a fun thing to use. People like to play with those cards or just use your fingers. Planning rules. So what happens before this meeting, a tech lead takes, goes behind the whiteboard, picks up those tasks, those user stories or tasks from the ice box, puts them into the backlog, orders them by priority, makes sure the PM is happy with that priority, because PM wants certain things to be done first, right? So PM is happy with the priority things are on the uh, backlog, and then the meeting happens where we estimate the tasks. Then we estimate the tasks, only one iteration worth of tasks, and then everyone goes back to their desks and can start programming. And this happens every week. And at the end of the week, we just clear out everything that's done. Put more tasks from the icebox into the backlog. Again, we might reprioritize some of that stuff, make sure that PM is still happy with our priorities, and repeat. So uh, once the week begins, I mean, for, in our case, the week begins on Wednesday when our estimation meeting ends. That's the beginning of an iteration. So when you're done estimating, the iteration has officially started, and you have one week, or some people do two week iterations, to complete all the tasks for that given iteration. And during that week, don't pick and choose what you like to do. I'm sure there's some fun tasks, right? But you don't wanna be um, disliked by your coworkers, first of all. You wanna be nice to other people, and everyone gets their share of so-called shit work, right? If there's a shitty task, and you happen to be one who is ready to start working on something, and the shitty task is on top, too bad, it's your shitty task, you're gonna work on it. Um, next week, someone else gets the shitty task. I mean, how do they say it? Karma is a bitch, right? Everyone gets shitty task at some point. So don't feel like, I mean, statistically, you are, you're not gonna end up with all the shitty tasks. You might have two or three in a row, but you're not gonna be doing all of them, so don't worry about it. Um, and um, yeah, I might be working on one or two, sometimes three tasks. Uh, the reason why I'm working on multiple tasks is because some of them might be blocked. Or if I'm working on integration tests and they run for 30 minutes, I'm not gonna be twiddling my thumbs, right? I mean, there's only so many coffees I can drink in a day. It's not like I'm gonna go have coffee every time I turn on the, the, the test. So I have 30 minutes to do something else. I pick a task from the whiteboard. So I, I do two things at the same time. It's very common people work on two things at the same time. And uh, what's beautiful about the, the task tracking is that 
anyone who comes, who gets to see the whiteboard knows who is working on what, who is blocked on what, which task is in what state of doneness, and um, you don't need to be sending any kind of status reports to anyone. Your manager wants to know how you're doing, I'll be like, just didn't have anything in the backlog? Just look at the backlog, you'll know what we're doing. You don't need to do unnecessary meetings and status meetings and stand-ups. Uh, stand-ups are good for certain situations, but if you are doing this right, you do not need stand-ups. Because think about how much time you waste during a stand-up. Let's say you have, in the best case, 10 minutes stand-up every single morning. So that's five times a week, so that's 50 minutes. How many people are on the team? Let's say four people. 200 minutes of engineering time wasted on stand-ups, when all you needed to do is to look at the uh, whiteboard or backlog and see who is working on, one, on what, who is blocked on what, and if someone has a question or needs to get advice from the rest of the team, we all sit in the same room. I can just walk over and be like, hey, uh, I'm doing this thing. You've done it like three months ago. How did you do that? Or like, uh, whatever, right? You don't need everyone to be standing around and listening to you having conversation with one person. So I believe stand-ups are unnecessary. Personal opinion. And this is again, to, to prove my point, this is what happens to you when you do stand-up. <laughs> stand-up comedy. Um, yes, it is wasted time. Uh, if you do stand-up, who doesn't know what stand-up is? All right, so stand-up is a meeting where people are standing because when you stand, you don't want a meeting to last for too long because it's uncomfortable to stand. So because everyone stands, that ensures the meeting is not going to last for too long. And it's like a quick status meeting that happens usually in the morning every single day where you have four to six people in a circle and they usually hold a sponge or a stick or, or something. There's supposed to be some kind of talking stick, like a totem or some, some Indian, Native American thing. But, or you can just grab a sponge. We don't have a sponge, but like, imagine this is a sponge. I'm holding a dirty sponge. I have the right to speak, no one else. So I'd be like, okay, well, yesterday I was mainly blocked on this thing. Uh, I had a meeting with the so-and-so, and I found out that we cannot really do it this way because blah, 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 blah. I'll give them the status of, my, of what I'm working on, right? And today I'm trying to accomplish this. I'm trying to finish this integration test. I'm trying to finish your code review. And I'm sorry, I've been, I've been too busy. I'll finish your code review too. And uh, I'm blah, 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 right? This is basically what a stand-up is. And then I'm done talking. I give it to someone else. And this other person grabs the, the, the object that gives them the right to talk. And they hold it. And they'll be like, all right, uh, well, I have done this yesterday. And this is what I want to do today. And then it goes like this in circle. When you finish the circle, we all just go back to our desks. 10 minutes wasted, just like that, OK? So try to avoid stand-ups, unless you absolutely have them. Teams that don't do agile, they need to do stand-ups, because how else are they going to communicate what is everyone working on? They need to have stand-ups to communicate the status. Do you do stand-ups? OK, good. OK, what time is it? I think I'm going too fast. OK, two minutes. Ah, yes, this is the one to the last slide. OK. Retrospective. Retrospective is something that if you want to improve what you're doing, you should have retrospective. Uh, at the beginning of the talk, I asked you to send me your feedback about this talk. That's my version, my way of doing retrospective. I'm trying to improve what I'm doing. I need to get feedback from you so I can improve my talk. In retrospective, you would uh, do it by maybe once a month or once a quarter. You get people in the room for, for one hour. You give everyone three post-it notes, three sticky notes, like this. You can color coordinate, or it can just be white, doesn't matter. Oh, wow, these guys have four. OK, so here is a smiley face. So you go on a whiteboard, you have a whiteboard, you make a big cross on it. You divide it into four quadrants. You put a smiley face in one quadrant, this one. 
you put a sad face in the other quadrant. Look, look, it's even covered with stickers. That's how unhappy these people are. Then you put, then you put, um, what is it, the light, light bulb for ideas and suggestions, right? And I don't know what the fourth one is. I think those are action items or something. And everyone has five minutes to write what they want on those three stickers. On the first sticker, they're going to say what went well, what they're happy with. They love the offsite. They love that people now do code reviews fast and you have to wait for them. They love blah, 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 whatever they like, they describe. On the other sticker, they say what they don't like, things that don't go well. You can complain, the build is always broken. It takes me forever to, to sync to a good CL change list or sync to head. Uh, you can complain any, about anything you want, uh, mainly process things, things, can, things that can be possibly improved by changing the process and the way, um, and the way uh, you work as a team. And in the third one, uh, in the last card, you're going to write your ideas and suggestions. Because it's really easy to complain, right? But do you have a solution? Sure. Write it on a little post-it note. And then when everyone's done writing in five minutes, we go in circles and we read all the happy cards first. We write them, or we just stick them here and read them out loud. And then we brainstorm the ideas of what do we want to do to improve the situation so we don't end up with any unhappy faces next month or next quarter. And at the end, you always go home from the meeting. You go away from the meeting with action items that have owners. Because it's, it's one thing to say, oh, it would be so cool if we have an offsite. Let's go on a trip. But there's no one to plan it. It's not going to happen, right? So always assign uh, the things that people agree on as action items. Make sure they have owners. And they can be tasks. And they can go back on the whiteboard, on the backlog. So this is this, I, I promise, right before Q&A, this is the last thing I want you to remember. There's a lot here. but. If you don't remember anything else from this talk, these are the main things I want you to remember. There's a difference between feature or user story and a task. Always break them down and always differentiate the two. Always estimate the complexity of the task, not the time it takes to make the task. Because you never will be able to estimate the time. You will always be wrong by the factor of two, at least. Uh, estimating is not about writing down numbers. It's about clarifying what needs to be done. Because that process of estimating is what matters. Not those numbers, but the process of going through the exercise. Always order tasks on the whiteboard by priority. And always work from the top. Have everyone work from the same list of tasks, top to bottom. Estimate and repeat every one to two weeks. And look back once a month during retrospectives. And this is the last. This is a Q&A that you were asking me to start. Uh, we can start with Q&A. And don't oh, okay. forget to send me an email if you have any questions. Petka at google.com. OK, we have plenty of questions. I probably won't be able to answer all of them. So first one, uh, do people leave your open space to find a quiet place to actually get some work done? You get most of the work done, believe it or not, in your, at your desk. You only need quiet place when you need to conduct a phone screen, an interview, or uh, when you need to have some private meeting. For that, we have conference rooms, all sizes from a large rooms like this to small huddle rooms for one or two person. Um, it's not very loud on the floor. Sometimes you hear laughs. But peop and sometimes people use the F word when they get pissed off. But you don't really hear much other than that. So it's not like it's, it's not very loud. It's not very disruptive. You can always have listen to meditation music. You can be in the zone. I have not met anyone who would not be able to. And I mean, like I said, we have 25,000 software engineers uh, at Google. Everyone is able to work with people next to them. It's just fine. OK, uh, so next one. What did you do to get to where you are today, your path to senior software engineer? OK, so it starts with getting a degree in um, computer science, informatica, or something related. There are people that I work with that have a degree in physics, chemistry, uh, or other um, science, um, 
science majors. Um, I have sent a resume, my resume to jobs at google.com. I have received a, a call in three days, a phone screen, and two weeks later I already had the offer. Um, and then I was just doing my best, I guess, working, being nice to people, that's very important. I mean, there are some people don't have, uh, th this is the one thing that we, we hire for, not only your technical skills, but also what we call Googliness. It's a cliche sounding word, but being googly just means that you're not a dick. You are a nice person. You are not gonna c uh, quickly go into the elevator and try to close the door so that you know they don't delay you. You're not the one who's gonna take the last cookie in the, in the in the dining room, right? We're trying to get the feel for people and we try to work with people that are fun, relaxed, and when you work with people like that, it's guaranteed there will be much less drama if you work with nice people. If you're nice to them, there'll be less drama. You can just focus on the work and not on drama. And uh, look for interesting teams. I, I, I wanted to work on uh, something important, so I worked on search for three and a half years. I love Gmail, so I wanted to work on user-facing products, so I worked on Gmail for three and a half years. Then I realized that I didn't want to commute to Mountain View, so then I decided I want to work from San Francisco office, and I transferred to uh, what used to be called Google Wallet, now it's called Android Pay. And once you find the right team, you're, it's fine to stay there, but uh, we are encouraged to switch every 18 months, and we are encouraged to get promoted every two to four years. So we are kind of, actually we are expected to grow and we are, everyone is expected to get the senior software engineer. Uh, and some people are expect, uh, certain percentage of people will go beyond that obviously, but uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, oh, okay. I have a coworker here from Zurich, I heard. Where, where are you? Hi. Okay, so now a uh, kind of hard question. Uh, Google does open source by fork and keeps stuff secret, Ubuntu, proprietary Android, or contribution hostile, Chrome. Will Google ever start doing open source right in the community? What's the question? <laughs> Gee, Google does open source by fork. Obviously, we're not going to open source everything. Why would we, right? There are things we don't want to open source. It's up to us what we do, right? Um, and we keep stuff secret. Well, yeah, we want our security, details of our security to be secret, right? We don't want hackers to hack our, our Linux. So what is it that's surprising here? Uh, Droid contribution, what's hostile? Oh, we don't like contributors, is that what he's saying? I don't know. I don't know if anyone's hostile. I've never seen anyone hostile for the last 10 years. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, clearly something happened to this person and I don't know the details of that, so. <laughs> You know, uh, the, the problem is that uh, 36 people like this question, yeah, so. So. <laughs> so I guess people want to contribute and it's difficult to contribute to the open source code, is that the problem? I don't know what was intention of the question, but maybe. Well, maybe he's saying this is not like real open source because yes, we control a lot, we still control a lot. Probably that's the question. Well, I'm not that high level and I don't work for Chrome and those products that where the decisions are made, so I can't really speak for that. I don't know. Don't know. Okay, uh, so the next one. How fast the deployment is? How long it takes to have a feature shipped across multiply regions? Oh, okay, so there's one thing to ship within the US and there's a whole different thing to ship across multiple regions. It all depends on the product and what needs to be localized. And what, once we go into the different markets, there are lobbyists, lob lobby groups, there are, there's, there are law that needs to be, we need to follow their law, there are things that need to be adjusted, terms of service need to be different. So that takes much longer than having to implement something within United States. And uh, how long did these things take? So for example, Gmail, it started, local, it started as, a, as a private 20% no, project of this, uh, uh, one of my coworkers, and he just did it because he didn't like to use, I think, what did we use, Firebird? What's the name of that, G that uh, email client? We used some email client he didn't like, so he just created this thing, this web app called Gmail. And then we started using it locally, as a, uh, internally, as it had its own code name. When I joined Google, we were using it. It was called something else. And 
three years later it was, or two years later it was public. So I think it might take anywhere between a year and three years. But it depends. I mean, I'm sure Chrome wasn't in, developed that fast. It depends on the size of the project. Okay, so the next one. What is Google's programmer tester ratio? So this is interesting. At Google, we have three roles that kind of fall in that category. We have software engineers. I think outside of Google, you call these people developers, right? Because we develop new features on new code. Then we have SET, software engineer in test. And then we have TE, test engineer. So software engineer, software engineer in test, and test engineer, three different things. You're talking about testing, but all three of us are doing testing. All three different roles do testing. Software engineers are expected to write unit tests and integration tests for every feature they implement. So part of my work is to write tests for my own code and make sure I don't, that make sure they work. Because how, how else am I going to know for sure they work and all the edge cases are working, right? I need to think of the edge cases and write tests for them. But whenever I use some integration testing framework or something that I don't have time to implement, right? That's developed by SET, Software Engineer in Test. SET is a software engineer that focuses on testing infrastructure, and they create testing infrastructure. Um, test infrastructure for testing Android apps, uh, web apps, internal, anything. Anything for tests, uh, any infrastructure tool for tests is written by SETs, and I use those tools. But I write my own tests. Does it make sense? And TE. Test engineer is a person who writes test cases, and they're, they're different. It's, more, it's closer to QA. There's, we also have a QA, which is, menu, is, is a manual QA. QA is like uh, people, let's say, uh, we have lots of people in, in India that uh, do a lot of manual testing. Let's say they, they grab the phone, and then they test the features manually, make sure they work before we, we push the new build. Those are QA. The test engineer would automate this. These are the people who do, uh, who try to automate what's done manually. Then SET, software engineering test, writes frameworks, which software engineers use. Does it make sense? Okay. Okay. Uh, how many projects run PHP? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I've never heard of any. I, I didn't like Facebook use PHP, I heard, heavily. No. Uh, so one more, this one is kind of funny. How do I tell my PM he needs to throw a five, uh, f uh, 50 kilo uh, dollars Jira license into a trash bin and create two spreadsheets? Into a trash bin and create two spreadsheets. So again, this spreadsheet is not created by the PM. You, as a lead of a team, tech lead, team lead, create your own way how you track your tasks. PM is there to tell you what they want to get done. You're the one who writes it down on a card or puts it in a spreadsheet or puts it in an icebox on the back of that whiteboard. Or if a PM wants some kind of report from you, sure, create a spreadsheet or something that gives it to in the way they want to see it, right? But they cannot tell you how to organize your team because they don't, they are not engineers. They are. They have different responsibilities. They are supposed to think about what the user needs and define the requirements. They are defining the requirements and giving them to you. They are not telling you how to do your job. I hope. Okay. Uh, so one uh, last one, uh, kind of quick one. How many developers from Slovakia currently work at Google in Silicon Valley? Uh, in San Francisco, I'm alone. In Mountain View, I think we might have maybe five, maybe ten. I know I used to be alone. At some point, then uh, I referred uh, another guy, which you might know from AngularJS, Mishko Heveri. So then he joined. Then uh, now he works, I think, with like two more Czech guys, and there might be more Slovaks there. Uh, there's some. Uh, there's a lady that works at the front desk. She's she's so new. She's Slovak. It's kind of interesting when you go go to front desk to pick up your guests, and you start speaking Slovak to them, and all of a sudden the front desk lady is like. We heard you po Slovensky. <laughs> okay, uh, so that's uh, all. So uh, that's Silicon Valley, but I think that we, d we do have a mailing list, and at, the, at some point there were more than 100 people, but most of them were in uh, Ireland, Dublin, and Zurich. And there are some people in New York City, too. 
Okay, uh, so that's all. Time, time is up. Um, thank you for your talk. Are there it any questions from the audience? Or they uh, use the tool? Okay. They are using the tool, so it's kind of uh, nobody needs to run with microphone okay. around the room. So that, that's all. Thank you very much for the for the talk. Thank you. Good.